here today is a lesson from a very, very well-known story, The Prodigal Son. Today, I want you to read with me, starting at that verse, the 18th verse of Luke, chapter 15. I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again, and he was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. And verse 25 tells us there was music and dancing. Music speaks of harmony. Dancing is moving in that harmony. This is the story of a man coming back to God, entering harmony once again. He has been out of that harmony, but now he's moving with it. Many, many hearing me right now have been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, born again, but you somehow, somewhere back there months or years ago, stopped moving in a harmony with God. Discord arose in your life. Today I am going to talk about one of the most common reasons for spiritual discord. Many of us think like the prodigal son. I want you to notice what was on the son's mind and then in contrast what was on the father's mind. I want you to see how very little the son understood about his own father because this is how we misunderstand the nature of our heavenly father. The son imagined that he could restore himself to his father's graces by service by belittling himself and telling how small and unworthy he was. What a poor understanding this young man had of his own father. He thought his father would be pleased at his groveling and confessions of wickedness, his willingness to abandon his name and cast aside the very identification of his relationship, and also he wanted to be called a servant, or he was desirous to be called a servant. This prodigal actually thought his father would be pleased at this. I know many Christians who think God is especially moved by this type of behavior. They tell him how unworthy they are, how wicked they are. God thinks we are worth the price of his son. God thinks that one soul is worth more than the whole world. But many Christians still think there is some special benefit in telling God how unworthy they are. If we were not worth anything in his sight, then he would not have sent his only begotten son to die on a cross to save us. We must be worth much, much more than we can even comprehend in his sight. I know I wouldn't like it if my son Stephen kept telling me that he was no good and that he was unworthy. If he said to me, Daddy, I've been disobedient and you taught me this is wrong, so I won't ever call myself by your name again. I'm not worthy to be called by your name, what would you do? What would you do if your child took this attitude? I know that I would correct my son at once for thinking he was worthless and no good. I don't want a son with an inferiority complex. Do you? Well, why do we think God does? Why is it that we think God derives some special pleasure when we fawn like a dog? when we can't lift up our eyes, when we can only murmur about our weaknesses and our sins and our faults. The Bible says, Come boldly to the throne of grace to find grace in time of need. God wants us to come to him. We can do it because Jesus died on the cross and opened the way to the Holy of Holies. Why should a Christian continue to mourn his ungodliness? Didn't the sacrifice of Christ mean anything? Of course. When a man hits himself on the head with a hammer, we know something is the matter with his thinking. But when some people strike themselves emotionally day after day in the name of God, we call it virtue or holiness. Well, it isn't. There's just as much wrong with their thinking as the man who gives himself a headache with a ball-peen hammer. 
I counsel with so many people who belabor themselves day after day with thoughts about their wickedness. They think they're the worst person who ever lived. They can't see any good in themselves, and they hate themselves, so they think God hates them too. But God says, I'm not like you are. The prodigal came talking about his unworthiness, but the father kissed him and hugged him, not because he said he was unworthy, but because he was his son and he'd come back into his presence again. The prodigal said, I will be your servant. But the father didn't want a servant, he wanted a son. The son was thinking of occupation, but the father of relation. This is how we are. We approach God by works, but he is looking for a relationship, not based on works, but based on love. The father was hugging and kissing, giving and giving, and the son was talking about works, about being a servant, about earning the benefits already due him as a child of his father. Isn't this exactly what we do so many times? There are so many, many free gifts which come as a part of our relationship, but we want to get them by works. We're thinking about sweat and struggle, strain and striving, and that God is thinking about hugging and kissing. He wants to love us and to have us respond to that love. Try to picture in your mind how it was when the father met the son, when these two very different attitudes came together. The son was dirty and apologetic, his head hung down. He was trying to tell how evil he'd been, but look at that father. He's overjoyed to be with his son. He doesn't hear a word he says. He throws his arm about that boy and hugs him and kisses him. He looks at him with such love. We approach God and sometimes feel on the inside like the prodigal son looked on the outside, dirty. But the Bible says the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. The Father doesn't see us as dirty, but his children he wants to love. And the greatest mistake we can make is to replace love with service. God will not accept it as a substitute. We cannot relate with God through service only. We have an old expression in the evangelical school of thought, saved to serve. But this is not really true. We do serve. He wants us to serve him, but this is not the main reason he saved us. The first, foremost service we can do for God is to offer him our willing, open-hearted love. This is ministering to the Lord. Those who serve God most effectively are deep lovers of Jesus. There are those who walk in his love. Worship is first. Works is secondary. Many, many people hearing my voice right now have become dry and empty inside because they have left their first love. You know, many people misinterpret that scripture verse and they talk about losing their first love, but it doesn't say lost, it says left. Let me read it to you. It is found in the book of Revelation, chapter 2. The risen Lord Jesus is sending word to a church in Ephesus. He says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and have found them to be liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. You see, they were very active in works. Oh, they were doing many things. Jesus spoke about their labors and their struggles and their works, but it was in matters of love that they had fallen away. God called us to walk with him, to meet with him daily in adoration and praise, to delight ourselves in him. The Bible says, delight thyself in the Lord and he will give thee the desire of thine heart. Not in his work, but him. Worship is before works always. It is a glowing adoration of God that makes works effective. These people in the church of Ephesus had substituted works for love and they had lost out. Don't you remember when you were first saved, all oh, the love of God filled your life? Remember how you used to find yourself saying spontaneously, oh, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Now, all too many sigh and serve, swapping work for worship, getting so empty inside. Oh, turn back to love and the light of God will begin to burn higher in your life. 
The Apostle Jude warned the men of his day to contend earnestly for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And in verse 21 he says, keep yourselves in the love of God. The Bible says all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. The very first commandment is thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. Jesus said all of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Thou shalt love the Lord with all your heart and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. It is worship that awakens this love. You know the story of Martha and Mary. Martha was running about the house fretting and worrying if everything was all right for her guest. She was busy, very busy serving Jesus. Her sister Mary was just sitting there, sitting at his feet, hearing him speak. She loved him so. Martha said, Lord, don't you mind that my sister has made me do everything herself? Won't you tell her to get up and help me? Jesus said, dear Martha, you're so worried and bothered about so many things, but Mary has chosen the best thing. Some of you hearing me right now have become like Martha, struggling in works, fretting and striving, trying to do something for Jesus, worried that you're not doing enough, wondering and getting anxious because more souls are not won through your ministry. You're like the prodigal son, thinking about works and service when God has love on his mind for you. I wish every person, every person who's hearing me right now would have a little prayer meeting after this broadcast. Just tell Jesus how you love him. Drop your strivings for a while, just let them lay. Now turn your head upward to Jesus, telling how much you love him. Worship him, adore him, praise him. He's so wonderful. Oh God, we do turn our heads toward you and praise you. For you have given us all good things. For the great salvation that you've given us. For eternal life. We love you. We praise you that you would condescend to come into our lives. Oh wonderful God, you are so precious to us. I pray that your hand will rest upon the life of each and every person hearing my voice right now. Bless them, my Father, for I pray it in Christ's name. Turn their hearts toward worship and love. Amen. There's a river of love flowing inside of me, bringing new life and setting me free, lifting Shedding the fears, renewing my life, and drying the tears. Thank you, Lord, for this river. Send from you to me, never running dry, bringing peace and harmony. As you fill me through and through, thank you, Lord, for this river that can come from only you. There is freedom in this river, joy beyond compare. There is laughter, but there's sorrow, and you. to comfort and console me, give me peace I never knew, I'd be lost without this river, I'd be lost without you, let me sit in your presence and hear your loving voice, let me always remember that you give me the choice to flow with the river or follow my own way in the stillness of this river.